Amen. Amen. If you've got your copy of Scripture, turn to Daniel 9. If you don't have a copy, grab one behind you or in front of you in, this, in the pew. And it's on page 734. I encourage you to grab a copy. You're going to need it as we walk through the, the ninth um, chapter of the book of Daniel. As we look at faith in the face of adversity, we've been looking at it for some weeks now. We're trying to catch you up a little bit on, on what's going on. We're looking at this prophecy, some future events, but really today we get to look at, at how to live in the now, how to live according to the way Daniel sets the example for us and according to what God is, has called us to as his people. And Daniel, in this particular chapter, is praying a, a prayer of confession for his people, the people of God. And so as we think about that, I wonder what you would, would have to offer your people. And that's what we're going to look at today, specifically as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ. What do you have to offer someone else? Now, you think about that for a moment. You think, I don't have anything to offer. Or maybe your, your faith is not where it needs to be. Today's a day you can grow in your faith. In fact, if you're not growing in your faith, you're slipping, sliding away. So we're looking at this whole concept of, of confession. Now, I say confession is good for the soul. It's bad for the reputation. That's the title of the sermon today. And as we think about what we're going to be th- looking at in this prayer, I just want to remind you that confession is, is just saying to God what your sin really is. The same words. The Scripture says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sin, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We just sang about that. All our sins are forgiven. They've been washed by the blood. But if you don't confess those things before the Lord, you're not experiencing the cleansing power of of that blood. And so that word confession is the is the word homologio, which means the same words. So if you steal something, you call it stealing. You don't say, well, I just borrowed it until somebody else recognized that, and then I'm going to give it back. If you have, have lied, you say, I've lied. I've bear false witness. I've done wrong. And you don't say, I just told a little white one just to make somebody feel better. You just come right out and say the same words that God says about it so that you can experience the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. You come clean. That's what it means when you confess to a crime. You say, I did it. I've done wrong. I'm willing to face the consequences of all that I've done wrong. Daniel's praying that for his own people today as we look at this particular section. Everybody's got something to confess, even preachers. Whether you recognize that or not, don't say that too loud there in case you hear but there, there's an old story I, I want to share with you. Four preachers just kind of, um, just kind of relax, kind of informally sharing their weaknesses with one another. A group of preachers, and the first one says, "You know, I steal. I, I don't want to. It's a horrible thing for a preacher to steal. Wouldn't you agree?" And and so I take things that are not that don't belong to me. I don't know why I do that. The second one said, I, I struggle with alcohol. I like it, and sometimes I indulge it. A lot of times I indulge in it too much. The third one says, oh, well, I like women. I love beautiful women. These are bad preachers, are they not? You think about that? And the fourth one says, well, my weakness is gossiping. I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> We've all got something, don't we? We've all got some kind of weakness that we need to confess before the Lord, some kind of mistake that we've done. And sometimes we let those things go and go and go until we're hardened in our hearts that it's no longer sin. But we want to keep a short list with the Lord so you think about those things as we walk through this. What do I need to make right with God? Because God has offered forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ for everything that you've said, done, thought, but you need to claim that. And if you've never claimed his, his promise that He died in your place for your sin, the gospel, you need to do that first and foremost and enter into a relationship with Him through what Jesus has done for you. It gives us access to the Father. 
But we look at this passage of Scripture, it's a, a part of this book of Daniel we've been walking through. And this is apocalyptic literature. Now, just a little review for some of you who haven't been here. Apocalyptic literature has to do with an unveiling. God's showing us the end times. God's showing us the futures to a certain degree. But the first six chapters of Daniel are not like that. The first six chapters are historical. So it talks about things like uh, Daniel in the lion's den. That was our first week. That's in chapter 6. And we we, uh, looked at the fiery furnace, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how God rescued them out of there, and then the handwriting on the wall. So there are historical events that take place, and God is showing us the the span of human history we've gone over and over again in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, and again in Daniel's vision in chapter 7. So you you might want to review those, or might want to listen online. All those things are online just to kind of catch yourself up. Even if you haven't, though, you can... You can follow along what we're doing today. And so I'd encourage you, you haven't stepped into, a, into the middle of somebody's conversation. God's Word will speak to you if you'll allow that to happen. And as we, we think about this whole concept of apocalyptic literature, there's all these symbols and images, not so much today. There are a few numbers that we're going to deal with in the, at the end here of chapter 9. But primarily, it deals with Daniel's prayer. And so we're going to look at the preparation for that at, But when we think about a prophecy or a prophet, and this is part of what the people of God did, they didn't listen to the prophets God sent to them. Now, the prophets served two roles. They they shared the future of what God was going to do, but they also were foretelling. They weren't just foretelling. They were foretelling what we need to do now. They were kind of like preachers. And because the people of God didn't listen to the prophets, the preachers of their day, they faced the judgment of God. That's a word I want you to hear today. If you don't listen to the preacher today, you're going to face... (laughs) That's what happened in in the Old Testament. But as we think about the truth of God's Word, we know that there's something in it for us to see about who God is and His character. I hope you'll, you'll grasp that in this chapter. And there's something to see in it about us, about who we are as humanity as we, we try to connect and relate to God. And then there's something in this that we are to do, how we are to put it into practice or apply it to our lives. And then always, always something to share. Every time you come to a passage, think about those four questions. What's it say about God? What's it say about us? What does it, or what is, am I to do? And then what am I to share? That's a great way to discover the truth of God's Word for yourself. So I just encourage you to do that. I've, some fellows have shared that with me recently, and I wanted to share that uh, with you as well. So when we look at this prophecy, I want to share a, a quote with you from Winston Churchill. In World War II, he said these words as he was giving a, a press conference in the midst of the war on February 1st, 1943. He said, I always avoid prophesying beforehand because it is a much better policy to prophesy after the event has already taken place. (laughs) He was a wise man, was he not? I guess that's one way of making sure that he would be a true prophet. But in the Scripture, you knew a true prophet if what they prophesied came true. And if it didn't, they stoned him. They killed him. So this is serious business, this prophecy deal. Uh, Deuteronomy 18.22 says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. So if it's not, it doesn't come true, it's not true prophecy, and they got rid of the prophet. So when we look at, at what Daniel is saying here, we know in several places in the book of Daniel... There are things that he has been given in in dreams and visions that have already come true. And that's true of all prophecy in the Bible. A lot of what was given to them, it was future for them, but it's past for us. But a lot of what was future for them is future for us too. Especially as we deal with the end times. Obviously, it's not the end times yet. We haven't come to the end yet. Jesus is not back yet. And so when we think about what's going on in this particular uh, chapter, 
We're going to see the last verse especially is a, a future sort of event. And anytime I see a future sort of, uh, a future event, I'm like Churchill. I, I want to make sure that what somebody is saying is, is true. So I am very cautious in interpreting that and saying this is going to be this and this is going to be that and Jesus is going to come back here. And I, I believe uh, I, I'm very cautious, okay? But I think there is some some things that we can know, some insight that we've been given. In fact, as we start, or as we look at this passage, we're going to look at it in three different sections. I want you to look at the first two verses of Daniel uh, 2 with me, and we're going to stand in just a moment as we read chapter, or verse 3 through 19. But right now, would you look at verse 1 and 2? It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Now remember, the Medes and the Persians took over for the Babylonians, and the whole scheme and scope of things in the book of Daniel. The son of, anybody want to pronounce that? Ahasuerus. If you say it real fast, they don't know if you said it wrong or not. Who became the king of the Babylonians. And during the, the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from the reading, or from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. Okay, so let's just put the pause button on for just a moment. Again, this is introductory material. Darius is a, is a Mede. He's taken over for the Babylonians. So if you're looking chronologically at the book of Daniel, I don't know if you remember this or not, so I'm just going to review this for just a second. Don't count, don't count how long it takes, but chapter 7 and 8 are two visions that actually take place between chapters 4 and 5 in the history of Daniel chronologically. And this chapter, chapter 9, takes place right before Daniel's thrown in, or during the period Daniel's, before Daniel's thrown in the lines then in chapters 6. So the Medes are now in control. You with me? That's not too hard to follow, right? So the Medes and the Persians are now in control. And as, as we see what's going on, it's about 539 B.C. Why do I say that? Because the exile took place, and Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, are captured about and, and taken off to exile into Babylon about 605 B.C. Why, do I, why does that matter? All these dates, you think, am I in history class? No, you're not in history class. But important because this is 66 years they've been in exile. And, and what is about to take place in the, is they're about to get out of exile. Seventy years or so, they're going to be in exile. And so Daniel, if he's 14 or so, when they take him to exile and it's 66, 14 plus 66, you, you add that pretty quick. He's an 80-year-old man at this point. And here's what I want you to see from this, these two verses here. Daniel is still studying, learning, reading the Scripture. How many 80-year-olds do we have in here? Would you just raise your hand real quick? I know you're proud of that. When you get to 80, you're proud to be 80. Right? And I know those... Raise them high. Be proud of that. Would you just stand up? Stand up for just a moment. Everybody, if, if you can stand up, I think you can. Right, here we go. Here we go. 80. I cannot believe... Are you sure? I need to see some of your driver's license. I don't believe some of you are 80. But think about that. How and think about those. I know most of those eighty-year-olds are still learning. Or so you can be seated for are still learning, still growing. So what's your excuse if you're not eighty yet? You think about this. You never get too old. And we we quit calling it Sunday school because that seemed like a kid's thing. It's life groups now, but that's what we do. We learn. We prepare ourselves in those life groups and those small groups to be who God wants us to be and to grow in that. Because as we look at this passage, what Daniel is doing, he's reading Jeremiah. You recognize that one prophet is reading another prophet. Now, Daniel's probably a young boy when Daniel, when Jeremiah writes his. They're contemporaries to a certain degree. And then and when we, we think about what Daniel is, is doing, is he, is he knows, and you and I need to know too, especially when everything else seems to be changing all around us, that we can count on God's Word to be an unshakable foundation. 
an incredible light in the midst of the darkness. I don't know who to trust or where to trust. So I, I want you to know there are three things throughout the history of Christianity that are going to cause you to grow, are going to help you grow. That is Scripture, prayer, and God's people. Scripture, prayer, and God's people. And all of them are found in this ninth chapter. Daniel, as he reads uh, Jeremiah, he is remembering some things he's not, he's not remembering. But we know from what Jesus has said that the Word of God never passes away. Matthew 24, 20, or 35 says, Heaven and earth are going to pass away. But Jesus says, But my words will never pass away. And the psalmist says it this way. Long ago... Long ago, can we get uh, that, those uh, Matthew 24, uh, 35, and then Psalm 119, 152? I want them to see that. Long ago, I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. The grass withers, Isaiah. Now, this was right before Daniel. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Now, we have this little challenge coming up. I want you to hear this. Some of you have never read the Bible. I know that. I know that full well. We were interviewing for Pastor Search Committee one time, and we were talking about um, things, and they asked me, when I went to Hereford, they asked me, have you, have you read the whole Bible? I said, yeah, I've read the whole Bible. And and then uh, they turned to Jennifer and asked, have you read the whole Bible? And she said, no, I haven't read all, the whole Bible. But she had read most of it. She hadn't read it all the way through. I, I'm not trying to. She has now. <laughs> and so uh, at, that, at, at that moment later on, the ser- chairman of the search committee said, you know, I was glad they didn't go around the room because none of us had read all the Bible either. And they're on the, the pastor search committee. I know. I know some of you, many of us have not read it all. So why do we come and listen to it preached and, and come try to learn about it if we're not going to read it ourselves? So we had this little challenge in 70 days. We're just going to read through the New Testament. Because the Old Testament and what we're doing right now, you can get bogged down in pretty easy. And we don't want you bogged down. We want you understanding and hearing the gospel, the good news about Jesus and all that He wants us to be and do. We're going to start there. Now, the Old Testament has its place, I want you to know. And, but, but we're going to start there. So there is a little card, and it may be in the back of your, your pews as well or your seats. Is it green? You see that there? Hold that up. Yeah, we got that. So grab one of those. That's going to start September the 28th. That's a, a couple of weeks. And you, let's just all read the, through the New Testament together. Okay? And I'm going to give you a quiz every week. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I want you to be in the Word because it, it lasts. I mean, it endures. We need to dive in in these times and not listen to every whim and every voice. And man, I can get scared in a heartbeat. I can get worried in a heartbeat. But when I read the unending, unchanging character of God and what He's doing, I, I have confidence. That's the first thing on your bulletin, on your outline, that I, I want you to see. What we have to offer other, other folks through all of this is just a little insight to God's plan. We're learning God's plan. And Daniel was learning from another prophet, uh, Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was saying things like this even before the exile. Remember, they're in this strange land. He was saying in Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, before it ever happened, the whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, and declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. So he's saying... Years before this happens, God's going to bring judgment on His people because they're not turning away from idols and they're not turning away from their own ways. They're not doing what I've called them to do through the prophets. In fact, they are mistreating and abusing the prophets. There's coming a day where I've had enough. 
Folks, that still happens in our day. I don't know that God causes everything that happens, but He certainly uses everything that happens in our world. And He, can you imagine? I mean, you, you watch enough, you see enough, you know enough to know. it got to be a day where God says, that's enough. Let's do something to get these folks' attention. Is that our day? Could be. We better wake up. Pay attention. And so as we think about what he says later, though, this is what I, I love about Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 29, and what Daniel was reading here in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 11, he writes to the exiles, to the people uh, that uh, Daniel is, is living with. And in Jer- Jeremiah 29, 11, you, know, you probably know that verse. It says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future. And a hope. And here's the background of that. He's, this is what the Lord says in Jeremiah 29, 10. You'll be in Babylon for 70 years. And he, he again says that. But then, and that's almost over in the book of Daniel. But then, I'll come and do for you all the good things I've promised. And will bring you home again. Back to the promised land. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And in those days when you pray, I'll listen. And if you look for me wholeheartedly, if you seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I'll be found by you, says the Lord. And I'll end your captivity and restore your fortunes. And I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you Home again. To your own land. That's a good word, is it not? To people who are in a strange land, God wants to bring us home. I don't know if things are ever going to get back to normal. I don't know what normal is anymore, but I know He wants to bring us home. So when we think about what we are to do in order for that to happen, we pray and we seek Him and we seek Him wholeheartedly. We seek Him in His Word because what we had to offer The other folks in our world is an understanding of God's working and God's plan and an insight that He's given us from His Word. second thing I want you to see is found in verses 3 through 19. Would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? And we're looking at Daniel 9, 3 through 19. Grab that copy. Verse... or. Page 734 if you don't have your own copy. Daniel says, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with Him in prayer and fasting. I also wore sackcloth and sprinkled myself with ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, You are a great An awesome God, you always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to the all the people of the land. And Lord, you are right. But as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, We and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we've sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, forgiving, even though we have rebelled against Him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions He gave us through His servants, the prophets, 
All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing His truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster He prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all these things, for we did not obey Him. O oh Lord our God, You brought lasting honor to Your name by rescuing Your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all Your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn Your furious anger away from Your city, Jerusalem, Your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and Your people. Because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. Oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead for your own sake, Lord. Smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh, my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act for your own sake. Do not delay, oh, my God, for your people and your city bear your name. You may be seated as we look at that a little more. What's he doing? Of course, he's, a, he's confessing that we've, like we've talked about, but he's, he's also asking God for mercy, and that's what we had to offer. Our world is intercession. Boy, when we did the peace and prayer thing, we were amazed that people would come and just have their hearts broken because we were actually praying for them and praying for our community. And we think about how much our world needs prayer. People will respond. I've never been, not one time in my life have I ever asked, can I pray for you? Have I ever at one time been rejected? And that's the thing that we can offer other folks if we will. We don't have to do it in a weird sort of way, but we can do it in a real personal sort of way. When someone's hurting and we don't know what to do and we don't know what to say, here's what we do as preachers. We always say, let's pray. <laughs> let's pray. I don't know what else to do. But isn't that the response that all of us should have? Even if we don't do it out loud and vocally, and I know that's uncomfortable for a lot of you folks, would you do it? Would you pray? Would you intercede on their behalf? Think about the impact that the prayers of one person has had in the Scripture. God wanted to wipe out His people. And Moses in Exodus 32 and Numbers 14 said, No, Lord, hold off on that. Because of Your mercy, because of what You've done, don't do that, Lord, please. Please, hold back your hand of judgment on your people. There's a period of time when it, the, in the world it doesn't rain. Elijah prayed that it would not rain because the people of God needed to experience a, a time of famine and drought. And it didn't rain. And then Elijah prays again in 1 Kings 18 and intercedes. And it rains. Well, there's some farmers in our world who need Elijah in their lives, don't they? And, and James 5.16 says the prayer of a righteous man Availeth much. It gets a lot done. Is effective. It also says in that passage, if, you can, if you'll confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you'll be healed. So here's what I want you to do right now. Confess your deepest, darkest sin to that person next to you and allow them to pray for you and you'll be healed. Nah, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But there ought to be somebody in your life that you can be honest with. I'm not a priest. You don't come to me in confession. But 
There ought to be somebody. There is somebody that you're always able to go to. And his name is Jesus. You don't need any other go-between. And the scripture says he is ever interceding on your behalf at the right hand of the Father. And if Jesus is doing that, and we are followers of His, then that's what we ought to be doing. Interceding on behalf of other folks. Interceding on behalf of our oikos, our family, our friends, our neighbors. If we're not praying over them, God's not going to move. Because that's what He wants. Us calling out to Him. It's not as though we change His mind, but it is as though we agree with Him in what He wants to do in prayer. And we are changed as we intercede on behalf of other folks. Can you do that? Will you do that? Who will be that one in this generation, in this community, in your family who will pray? For me, that's my mother. Oh, man. I can tell you, and she'll tell you, I'm, I'm one of four kids. She says I'm the toughest one to raise, for sure. I increased my mother's prayer life a great deal, especially during my high school days. And, and so I know the value of an intercessor like that. And one of the things that's so difficult during this period is I can't get in there to share with her the things that I need her to pray over as easily. One of the things that's difficult about the disease she has and she hallucinates and her mind's not as clear is that she doesn't know exactly what to pray anymore. But I know in her heart and her spirit she's still praying. And I know that God wants to use you and me in that regard as well. Would you? Would you intercede on the behalf of other folks? That's what Daniel does. And just a year later, Cyrus, the one who's head of the Medes and Persians, sends back someone to Jerusalem to begin the process of rebuilding the promised land. God answered. God answers our prayers. Not always the way we Want, not always the way we think they should be answered, but the way He knows is best. And who are you going to trust? Yourself or the all-knowing, all-powerful Lord? So that's the second thing I want you to see. Is we have to offer other folks intercession. We pray for God's mercy. That's what Daniel does. He prepares himself with, in sackcloth and, and ashes. That's the, that's the terminology for mourning. He's mourning over his own people's sin, and he's serious about this matter, and he comes before the Lord pleading and begging and knowing that he is part of the problem. You see, in the book of Daniel... We never see any dirt on Daniel. Most of the Old Testament characters, there's some dirt. Not Daniel. Until here. Until he admits it himself. Until he says, I'm part of the problem. And I need help myself. And we have done this. And what they had done is they had gone after the gods of the culture. Idols. Folks, do you think there's an issue in our day? With idols still? I mean, do you think there are are other things besides the Lord that we give our attention and our affection toward? You think, I'm not an idol worshiper. I I don't have a little statue I bow down to. Oh, man. No, it's made of metal or it's made of brick or it's made of, of whatever. It's made of of sports teams and sports logos, or it's made of all those things that are such blessings to us, we have become made obsessions in our day and really have been stripped away from us. So it can be anything like, like money or it can be th- stuff like pleasure or comfort or anything that we seek after and that's what we want more than anything else is an idol. 
Because what we as the people of God, as followers of Jesus Christ, ought to be seeking after is His kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, trying to be like Him. And all these other things will be added unto you. Does that mean you're going to be rich? No. I don't know. Maybe. I just know you'll have life and right priority when you seek Him first. And when I've gone astray, and I would wager, I know preachers aren't supposed to wager, but I would wager when you've gone astray too, not just preachers, probably most people aren't supposed to wager, when you've gone astray too, it's been because you've put other things, maybe even good things, Ahead of seeking the Lord and the kingdom. That's what Daniel's confessing. That's what God has sent the people of Israel to a strange land about. And that's what God is forgiving. He caused them to listen to His voice in that strange land. And now they're headed back to where God wants them. So that's the immediate future. Now, in just a few verses, we're going to look at the end future. And I, this is the part that gets a little crazy. Okay, will you stay with me? Daniel 9, begin with verse 20. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, His holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, the angel, we saw him in chapter 8, who interpreted the vision there in chapter 8, whom I had seen in the earlier visions, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he explained to me, Daniel, I've come here to give you insight and understanding. And the moment you began praying, a command was given. And now I am here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. A period of 70 sets of seven. Stay with us. It has has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Okay? So, yours may say 70 weeks. Most... Most commentators, most scholars would say those, those weeks are, are uh, years, seven year periods. So 70 sets of seven, the New Living Translation translates that. I like that the best. So he's talking about a, a period of 490 years. And he's going to divide it up into three periods in just a moment. But before we get to that, here's what's going to happen in those 490 years. All of the, the people of God's rebellion is going to be finished, put to an end to their sin, And here's the key. Their guilt is going to be atoned for. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. And this is the most important part about these last few verses I want you to to hear. Okay? What's taking place here is the plan that God has put in place for redemption. For his people. You see, our rebellion hasn't finished, has it? And, and our there's not an end to our sin. We still sin as the people of God. But the key is the atonement for our sin. We couldn't live the law perfectly, and we still can't. We need someone to do it for us. And His name is Jesus. And He lived the perfect life. And He died the perfect death to become the perfect sacrifice for us on the cross. He did what we could not do. And He brought us back to life in the process of doing it. He atoned for our guilt. And the righteousness that we have, the everlasting righteousness, is not our own. It's His. And the the vision, the prophetic vision of the future is, is, is brought about by Him. And He's the one who took the place of the most holy place and, and the temple curtain was torn. Because now everybody has access to God the Father through what Jesus has done. 
And that took place in a period of, of 70 sets of seven. So if you want to go through the numbers with me for just a moment, you can do that. But I'm not going to cover all, all of that. And I think most of that is symbolic anyway. But there's a period here when they, say, when they send Ezra and Nehemiah back from the exile to rebuild the temple and rebuild the gates and rebuild the walls in, in the Old Testament. That's about oh, 400 or um, 457 to 445 B.C. So we got 490 and it's divided up into these three sets. The first group is seven sets of 70. Or seven sets of seven, which is 49 years. And and then the second set is um, 62 sets of seven, which is uh, 342 years. And then the last set is seven years, and that's the future part in, in verse 27. So look at those with me. Verse 25, now listen and understand seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven plus will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem under a a ruler, the anointed one. That's the period of time it took from the exile to get to the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, the atonement. This is happening hundreds of years before. Daniel's saying what God has told him to say. There's coming a moment when your sins that you could do nothing about, that you can't quit committing in your own power, are going to be dealt with. And that moment comes when the incarnate God, Savior of the universe, steps into history. In Bethlehem, through Jesus. And ultimately, that anointed one, look on with me, will be killed, verse 26. That's the cross. Appearing, in the New Living Translation, appearing to have accomplished nothing. Oh, but appearances can be deceiving, can't they? People in his day thought, what good was that? Even his followers thought we would put all our hopes and pinned all our hopes on him and now he's dead. But he didn't stay dead. Came back to life. And appearing to accomplish nothing, he accomplished everything for you and me. He took our debt. and Nailed it to the cross. And now you and I can be whole cleansed, free, alive. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. That's the Romans. And the end will come with a flood and a war and its its miseries are decreed. Now this is the future part from that time to the very end. And the ruler, that's probably the Antichrist, we're going to get to in chapter 12, will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of 70 for, and, but after this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate, fate decreed for this defiler, again the Antichrist, is finally poured out on him. Okay, so that's real confusing to me. As I've studied this all week long, it's still confusing. I don't expect you to get all of it, but I do... A, I hope you'll understand that these periods of time end with this it's time of tribulation at the end of time. Seven years of tribulation. And the climax of that is Jesus coming back. And so here's the, the catch. Here, here's the point I want to, to make with you. This is God's timetable of how things are going to unfold. And we operate on His timetable, not ours. There's some of you in this place today that need to make sure you get on His page, His timetable, trusting Him, knowing 
that you don't have to worry or be fearful of the end because you've accepted, received what Jesus has done for you and you're part of his kingdom. Now, I know that's a lot. But I know also as we think about where we're headed in the, in the future that, that we have this hope. I've been with people at the end of life. And we're all, whether we make it to the end of time or we just make it to the end of life, we all want the same thing there. We want to know we're at peace with God. We want to know we're headed to heaven. We want to know that everything's okay, that our sin is forgiven, that, that we, a lot of folks, a lot of religions believe that our, out, our good outweighs our bad. But for Christians, it never will. But we trust the one whose good outweighs all bad, and that's Jesus because He lived the perfect life and He died in our place. And the way we make things right with God is through Him. So if you've never done that, you can today. And if you have done that, who can you share that with? Who can you help understand what the end is all about, but what the now is all about too? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these moments. Lord, I ask that in these moments that your people would consider who they could pray with, pray for. Lord, I ask that you would show more of what you're doing in our world to us. Not just so our, our minds would, would get puffed up with knowledge and we think we're smarter or, or, or we think we're holier, but so that we can help so we can help people who are hurting. So that we can come and know, Lord, that you receive us just as we are, but you're in the process of changing us. Making us more like Jesus. I pray, Lord, that it, whoever's in this place that doesn't know for sure they're in your kingdom, that you'd show them. It starts with confession, admitting they need you, believing that you've done what you've done is for them on the cross, Jesus, and then choosing this day to follow you. Lord, I pray for other folks to be a part of the workers, the harvest, the church. I pray for folks in this place to recognize that it's not just coming and doing the religious thing, that it's becoming an army for you and your kingdom. Prepare us, Lord. Continue to prepare us. For the battle's coming. For the battle's here. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? I invite you to respond as God leads you, just as I am. He receives us that way, loves us too much to leave us that way. Maybe there's somebody you need to pray for at the altar. Maybe you need to pray with me, or maybe you need to be a part of this church wants to be faithful to the scripture and to the great commission of God, we'd invite you to, to come. Whatever God leads you to, would you respond to him right now? We we'll sing together. Just as I